Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Wall of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metzen. We just heard a wonderful song called Back from the Brink by my guest, Billy McLaughlin, fellow I've known for over 30 years and enjoyed his music every decade along the way. Billy, thanks so much for being yeah, here today. great to be here and thank you for having me on. Billy is uh, an award-winning guitarist. She's got a great story to tell how we went from playing right-handed guitar to left-handed guitar. I imagine it had something to do with the song you played called Back From The Brink. But before we get into that very intriguing story, Billy, tell us a little bit about how you started to play and when you started to play professionally. Oh, it goes back a ways. Uh, I was a three-time failure uh, with musical instruments. I tr tried the piano, the trumpet, and the drums, and I was a complete failure. And the joke is, three strikes and you're a guitar player, okay? <laughs> well, so I'm, this, I'm a two-time loser. Okay. I tried the trumpet and the piano. Yeah, and... yeah I, could, I, I couldn't. And my sister had this guitar hiding in her room, and she didn't want anyone in her room, but of course I snuck in there. Sure you did. And I was about 13, I guess. That's what you do when you're a kid and the doors are locked. Yeah, you growing up in South in Minneapolis with a big family, and... Uh, it just felt like it was the most natural of the, any of the instruments that I'd tried. I felt like, okay, I can, I can finally, you know, do this. And mm -hmm. I went to my parents and said, can I have guitar lessons? And they're looking at all the piano lessons and trumpet lessons right. and, and everything. And they're like, they're like no, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're not getting you any guitar lessons until you, you know, go to the library and get a, so that's right. what we did. We didn't mm -hmm. go on the internet. It, they said, go to the library and get a how to play the guitar, right. you know, for the complete. Nick Mananoff or right, something right? like that. Went and got Mel the, Bay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I brought it home, and I, I, I proved to them that I was really serious at this time. So again, I'm like 13, okay. 12, 13. And um, luckily, you know, and this is so important in the development of most players. Luckily, I had a, a group of guys around me and gals that were all interested in making music together. Not through a school program. We started a garage band right. when I think I was 14. And this idea of... Yeah, you can sit and play guitar by yourself, but unless you can lock in with a drummer. Right. And the way to get good at that, the way to improve your skills is to play with, with other, other players. Exactly. So I started playing, you know, as, as a 14, 15 year old, we started doing some of the school dances. I remember the very first one we did was Holy Angels in Richfield, the Sadie Hawkins dance. Sure. 1970, uh, something, seven, eight, maybe, <laughs> probably 78. Sure. And I got paid 50 bucks. Right, right. And I thought, man, I was chopping celery right. at Hong Kong Chow Mein on 53rd and Lindale for two bucks an hour. Right, more uh, lawns like, for a buck. This, yeah, this buck is like unbelievable. So I, totally I was get lucky that. that in high school, um, I went to Washburn High School and connected with a, a whole group of players that were really serious about. You know, we want to be a great band in mm -hmm. high school. So I was never home, man. I was like, leave for school, go right to the, the garage where we yeah. practice. And I was never home. We were jamming all the time. What, uh, what tunes were you playing? A uh, lot of, you know, my hero. And, and if, you, if you said, you know, Billy, was there a transformative moment for you with the guitar? It would be, there used to be a PBS show. I think it was called Soundstage or something. Sure, yeah, yeah, something yeah. Something like that. And I'm watching this on channel two, and there's this Hispanic looking guitar player with his eyes closed. And there's no words, but I understood what he was mm -hmm. saying. It like went straight to my heart. It was Carlos Santana. Wow. And I thought, ah, that's who I want to be. Right. You know, so there's a lot of Santana, Earth Wind. We had a horn section, real good horn section. So we were doing Ronnie Laws, you know, nice. and Earth Wind and Fire and Steely Dan and and had, had a great... What kind of guitar center. were you playing back then? I was playing a, a Gibson Marauder. Oh, rock right on. Well, that version. was... Wasn't that... Uh, wasn't that kind of like the guitar Santana was playing back then? Well, it, it was the guitar that I could afford... That looked as much like I that. Until I could get a Les Paul. Yeah. You know? So we just had a gas, and we were, we were booked by Marsh Productions and, Marsh and, 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 and uh, G, GMA. I, I got to get Edelstein on the show. Yeah. In fact, I, we, I did a little... Facebook Live thing here okay. with you uh, while we were getting the camera set up, and Marsh was watching. And I, you know, I, I wanted because he's got a, you know, he's been 60s and 70s. He was Mr. Rock and Roll in town. Sure. Plus, I want to find out how he gets that tan. 
Oh, right. Yeah, he always had that. He always, Middle of February, man, that. the guy looks yeah. good. So the band in high school was called Paradox. And, sure. Uh, and it was, there were two Paradoxes. We weren't the heavy metal band. We were like the R&B version of that. And we, man, we did a ton of high school dances. I always told my parents that we were playing high schools, even when we transitioned into playing the bars. Right, right. I wasn't out of high school yet, and we were playing bars. Right. Uh, most of the guys in the band were a few years older than me and off in college already. And when it came time for me to graduate, I thought, you know, I love music so much and I hardly understand it at all. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I, I was self-taught up until that time. I lucked out and had a music theory class my senior year of high school. And Paul, without that class, when, when I got into the program that I, I ended up graduating from at the University of Southern Cal, which has a great school of music, very serious musicians, mm -hmm. there, great orchestral program. I would have flunked out my freshman year if I hadn't, through the Minneapolis Public Schools, right. gotten what they called a zero hour class. Like it was a, a class that, that Bill Lydell volunteered to teach at hmm. like 7.15 in the morning, you know, when the, the school's basically empty. Right. It wasn't first hour, it was zero hour. Right. A committed teacher. And, uh, yeah, he was unbelievable, unbelievable influence that he had on my life. And so I lucked out and I was able to hang um, in, a, in a university level uh, program, had to work on my sight reading, had to do all that right. like stuff that I, I, I didn't get into music because I loved that thing. I got into music because of the way it made me feel better, Right. you know? Like the healing power of right. music has always been a big thing to me, but um, it's like Bob so the Mar band, you know, like, I, like, like Bob Marley he, says, he yeah. he who feels it knows it. it. Yeah, yeah, I love that line. So so I leave Minnesota to go to college. That band breaks up, and those guys go on to do a bunch of other projects. Uh, P.J. Latovsky and and uh, his projects were just unbelievable, but. Uh, so I'm off at college, you know, getting a degree. Well, what, what's a degree really worth in the music business? Right. Like nothing, right. you know, other than if it expanded your own mind and your mm -hmm. own understanding. And, uh, or you could get a job teaching. Right, which was not the, well, well and certainly yeah, enough, that's that? probably the first, that is the first thing I did after I, I left L.A. I came back here to Minnesota and started teaching, lucked out and started teaching at Evans Music in oh, White sure. Bear Lake. Which is where I still live. I still live in, in, in White Bear. And that's where my buddy Joe, out there, he does all my work on my guitars. Okay. The finest, one of the finest guitar yeah. repairmen in town. Yeah, and John Evans and his family had a big influence on me deciding to stay here. Because I thought, you know, you go to L.A. and I didn't really accomplish my goals out there exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up coming back after some tough times of living in my car and getting ripped off. You know, wow. my Gretsch arch top got stolen. Ouch. And, and I just, you know, when you're from Minnesota, it's pretty hard to leave here. Yeah. Um, so, so coming back was a good thing for me because the amount of time I was spending stuck in traffic in LA, right. I started putting into my writing right. and started putting in directly into time on the guitar. And it was a, it was a very smart move to come back. I just it was on the phone yesterday with uh, actor musician Chris Mulkey, who's been on the Wall of Power TV. And he was on 403 going to a, a movie shoot. And uh, we had about a 45 minute conversation. He says, yeah, he goes, I'm three miles farther down the road now than when we started the conversation. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> you know? right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's not a very efficient place to live. I still love to go visit out there. I was just out there, but um, so you, you get back, you know, after being gone for years, a lot of your players, you don't know anybody really in town. Right. I'm up there teaching in White Bear and, and networking with a few people. And the young guys are taking over. Yeah, and I, and I lucked into a, a really wonderful gig. It was a, a, a project that uh, Jermaine Brooks, if you know the R&B singer Jermaine yeah, Brooks. Yeah, sure I do. Asked me to join the band. I was the, I was the token white guy in the yeah. band. I loved, absolutely loved this and met so many great players. The Johnson family, Kirk Johnson, right. uh, Kathleen Johnson, the, all, the, all the Rhonda, the, you know, the whole family. Kirk and went on to work with Prince for yeah, a long time. Yeah, for a long time. He was with them yeah. quite a lot. Uh, uh, so it was a great experience for me to, to go from being in this academic setting 
to like, can I really hang and groove with right. people that can really groove it? It blew my mind. And it was actually during that time. Well, those are all such great players. Yeah, and it was actually during that time that I was doing some of these weird guitar patterns and Kirk would say, Mac, I want to play along with you. And we came up with these funky beats and all of a sudden I started building the Billy McLaughlin project. So for years I had a, a seven piece band that toured the country and played a lot of shows back in the day when uh, so much was happening with Cities 97 sure. down in St. Anthony, Maine. Yeah. Remember all those oh, national yeah. I, players? I yeah. Several of those so gigs. So we, we lucked out and got a lot of those gigs and, and uh, but all the while I had this guitar thing where I would make a band record and then I'd make a guitar record at mm -hmm. the same time. And everybody said, you know, Billy's schizophrenic, you know, like, right. like why doesn't he focus on one thing and go further? Well, in the end, I was approached uh, by a, a major label, Narada Records, part of the Virgin Group. They approached me and said, hey, we want to sign you for your solo guitar music. And so that opened up a whole new chapter of my life. Now, were you doing primarily the tapping thing back then? It was a mixture. It was an equal 50-50 mixture right. when I had healthy hands, yeah. Now, we're going to, I think we'll probably be able to uh, dig up some video of you tapping, but tell people out there the difference between regular guitar playing and tapping. Right. Tapping is really more like playing a piano. It right? is, it is. Um, so, I heard a recording of a guy named Michael Hedges and it freaked me out because typically after all that education I could hear a recording and I had a pretty good idea of what the guy was doing hmm. you know typically in standard tuning any of the jazz chord melody stuff I could figure all that out but when I heard this guy it like it scared me to death because I was convinced there's no way it was one guy right and I finally saw on public access at the time here in Minneapolis they broadcast a uh, a concert that he gave at the Ordway, and I finally could see that he let Just go of in. the traditional thing of holding a pick, and he, I mean, he still did that at times, right. but suddenly he dropped the pick and he'd start doing this thing, you know, right. the Eddie, Eddie, it's, kind of, it's not really the Eddie Van Halen thing, right. Eddie was doing that on his lead solo work, but he never was playing bass lines right. and melodies, and here I'm hearing this, these very complex and very satisfying and complete solo pieces mm -hmm. from one guy on one guitar and I, I, I just got fascinated with it. And uh, this is right around the time that pickups for guitars got a lot better for acoustic right. guitars and you could amplify your... So I, so I locked myself in the basement for like an entire year basically. I'm teaching at Evans and locking myself in the basement for the rest of the week and working on some of these weird tunings mm -hmm. and patterns. And with Kirk's encouragement that the acoustic guitar can fit in a funky, cool setting with a great drummer and a great bass player. And, uh, you know, I worked with Enrique Toussaint for years and Al Wolovich even yeah. years ago. Uh, Al played with me for Yeah, that. Rich Manick on sax. I mean, it, it, Liz Quivnan on keyboards. We had this very cool project that I took out onto the college market for years and did the NACA right. national circuit. We put on tons of money. Was that when Kevin Daly was booking yeah, yeah, for yep, Pro Tem? Yep. Because that's where we met, because the early 90s, he was booking you, myself, um, Dan Buettner, the bicyclist. Oh, yeah, yeah bicycle, absolutely. Bicycle, Those bicycle, are the early uh, days. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Proton Productions actually started on my desk above Evan's music. And really? I, I, I booked so many gigs and I didn't want to do all the paperwork. And, and then I met Kevin and I said, Kevin, Daly. Kevin, take this over, man. I don't want to do it anymore. I just want to go out and play. We'll be back on Wall and Power TV with my guest, Billy McLaughlin, after these messages. Stick around. This program is brought to you in part by Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation. I want you to meet two gingers Irish whiskey. I'm Kieran and I'm Irish, so I tend to like a challenge. Why not? I wanted a whiskey to help find me out what's out there. Like what's really out there. And I found the oldest distillery in Ireland with a water wheel and awards for its small family of whiskies in the middle of Ireland. As I've always seen it, you can't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. So try it. The investment is small and the flavor is big. It's perfect for drinking neat. Its character holds up, like the Irish. 
when the bastards try to get you down. Two gingers Irish whiskey. Distilled twice for more character, time for more flavor, and less of the old burn. No litte bastard is carborundum. Don't let the bastards get you down. Welcome back to All of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metza. We are continuing our conversation with great guitarist and my good buddy, Billy McLaughlin. There's a couple of things I'm really amazed about you besides your phenomenal guitar playing. Number one is you have five kids and six grandkids. Yeah, that's all We're true. about the same age. I might be a couple of years older. I've got, a, I've got a, a lovely new rescue dog from Alabama named Blue, and I'm completely topped out. Okay. That's as much... That yeah. my gigs and this and that. I get it. So I really, I appreciate any musician that can raise a family as a musician and a healthy and happy family. So yeah. congratulations. Yeah. You. But tell people about your journey where, when you had to completely relearn how to play guitar from going from right-handed to left-handed and tell us about dystonia. Okay, so where we left off talking about me is I had just signed this deal with a subsidiary of, of Virgin Records, Narada Records, was, had a big fit, footprint in the acoustic, new, you know, anything that was acoustic back then, they just lumped it into new age. Right. I've never thought of my music as new age, for goodness sakes. I don't have right. any crystals or anything like right, that. Right, right. But, um, uh, Kevin Daly was booking me like crazy, and I was going out and doing 50 city tours, coming home, spending time with the kids for a couple months, go back out for another 50 to support these, these major label releases. And it was a few years into it, it was, uh, it was after I finished my second release for Narada that I'd get out to play, I mean, these are pieces, Paul, and you know this whole thing, it becomes muscle memory, right. and, and, and it is utterly, completely subconscious. Absolutely. And your hands are just, I, I played these tunes thousands of times, just killing them, you know? Right. And having a gas, showing people what one guitar can sound like. Right. You know, that was a turn on for me too. So I love the instrument so much. But here I am, it was the first leg of the, of the 50 City Tour after my second record came out. And I started having these weird little moments, you know? And I, I'd had a hand injury, uh, going into that season, but I had rehabbed and I thought everything was fine. But I would have these utterly humiliating, embarrassing moments where all of on a sudden, stage. You're, yeah, you, well, you're the only one on stage, Paul, right. too. You know, when somebody, when I used to, when the yeah. I'd play with the band, I'd play a bad note and I'd look at the sax player like he did it. You know, <laughs> right. But when you're playing solo gigs, right. you know, and the, you the can't notes go, are, you can't go drum solo. Right, and the notes aren't coming out. And th this was when you know I was really positioned within that kind of upper echelon of the of the hot shot yeah, players. Yeah, right. You know, that part of it wasn't that important to me. It was the beauty and the hypnotic effect of some of these compositions where. Anything that would go wrong would break the like the trance that right, I would try right, to get right. the audience into, right? So it was like it was just shocking to me, and it kept getting worse and worse. And I'm going like, holy crap! I, I have to leave this song off the list. Like it, 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 it especially started with the most acrobatic of mm -hmm. my pieces. Sure. And I'd start not playing those, and, and people would call for them, and I'd say, ah, I'm tired of that song. Right. I'm not playing it tonight. You're going to have to come back and see me in a year or something <laughs> yeah. like that. I, I lie to and my you know, audience, too. Yeah. So, and I mean, I was never a perfect player. No, nobody ever no. does. I mean, every, every player has a little mistake here and there. And here I am having these problems, you know, and trying to make my living right. and trying to compete, and there was no explanation for it. And I struggled with it. And I, you know, the record label noticed, and the booking team noticed. I was with Monterey at the time with Kevin, and I mean, no one was really judging me. But you know what happens when you're playing? When you see a sharp decline in a musician's playing, what do you think? Right. Drug. Yeah. Right. Well, I wasn't on drugs, man. I was having. I thought the problem was in my hand. Okay. Right. So what started happening is I started having trouble releasing my pinky and my ring finger on this hand as I'm up on the neck and the tapping thing is you know playing bass 
notes with this hand, right. bass lines, and playing melodies with this hand mm -hmm. on the neck of the guitar rather than you know strumming it. So here I am, my melody hand is 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 suffering, and it got it gets to the point where these two fingers curl up under the neck of the guitar, and I'm like I'm done. I this can't was three years. It was. I finally went to a neurologist, and that's where, it, you know, it brings us to what's going on um, coming up here. Did you, let me ask you before that, did you think at any point, boy, this is psychological, I'm starting to have some, some fear of performing or whatever? The hand doctors that I kept going back to saying, I know there's something wrong, you gotta take another x-ray of this, and they're right. like, Billy, there is nothing wrong right. with your hand. Oh, we'd like to suggest that you see a psychologist. <laughs> We think it might be stage fright, and I'm like, you guys don't know me. Right. I live. Right. That's that's right. my happy. You live place. for the stage, right? Live for it. Live for the uh, the connection right. with the audience. It's the most special thing you could sacred. ever ever sacred uh, that you could ever experience. So, so I'm driving home after the third time that they're saying, you know, you need to see a psychologist. And I started to go, maybe I am going crazy. Wow. But, you know, I knew that there was something. So I finally kind of faced the biggest fear, which when you grow up watching movies in the 60s and 70s, when, when the person gets real sick, it's always a brain tumor. Or something. Right. And they always die, right? So I did not want to go to a neurologist, but I kind of got my act together. And finally, after three and a half years of acupuncture, rolfing, right. every kind of therapy that you could think of, meditation, no sugar, no caffeine, you know, all those things, I finally went to a neurologist and I walked in and saw Dr. Janine Spear at Sister Kenny Musicians Clinic at Abbott Northwestern. There's a musician's clinic? Yes, there is. Wow. And and of course, you know, why wouldn't I know that after look you know, struggling? I for should three just go years. there for a tune up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I you know, made the appointment and I described that I'm having some odd movement disorders and I walked in the room and I showed her what was happening and she said, Billy, that is a classic textbook case of a condition called dystonia. And I, I remember hearing that word for the first time, dystonia. Right. What is that? And she where said- f That's where Fred Flintstone lives. Where, where, yeah, yeah, there's like a, I keep telling people you can't buy a plane ticket to dystonia. <laughs> But I said dystonia, and I, I was like initially relieved because yeah. I could I could quash all the rumors about my su supposed addictions or whatever. I had a con a condition. She says, Billy, it's not in your hand; it is in your in, in wow. and this hand is controlled on this side of the brain. So she said, somewhere up here, the wiring is not what it used to be, and you have a slurring of the the control centers on that side of your brain, and you know, so initially I'm relieved, right? Right. I have, there's a reason. Right. We've got an explanation now. But she says, you know, here's the bad part. We really don't have any therapies right. for it. And it's- The good it's, news it's, and the bad it, news. And it's gonna get worse. Oh, man. You know, based, based on what I'm seeing in my experience with the, with the other players out there that I've worked a lot with the orchestral players that develop this. It's, right. It's people that are really, it seems like it manifests, or at least it becomes, obvious by these players that are like hardcore, you know, lots of notes and that right. kind of thing. So a lot Violinist of classical, yeah, classical players. So, so she says, you know, you better think about what you want to do with the rest of your life. And wow. And, first, and how many kids do you have at that point? I've got the five kids. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I immediately jump online, right? This is Nine, uh, this is 2001, I finally got uh, diagnosed. And I start reading about this condition, dystonia. There's a ton of different forms. And the diabolical thing is guitar players will get it in their fingers, just like piano players mm -hmm. would. Flute players and trumpet players get it in their lip muscles. Wow. What they need the most. Singers get it in their vocal cords. Uh, it's insane. Yeah, yeah it, and and... Some people get it throughout their entire body and that's called generalized dystonia. And there are, 
I'm very involved with the Dystonia Medical Research Foundation, which is sponsoring this event that we want to talk about. In a and let's, before we get too much farther, yeah. let's mention where this event's happening. Okay, so at the Como Zoo, we're having our third annual zoo walk, we call it. It's not really a walk, and in fact, some of our support group members are, are people that, uh, the, the people that have dystonia would have a very hard time walking mm -hmm. a course. So really what this event is about gathering this community as we get a sense of who we are out there. And, and the community is getting bigger because diagnosis is getting better. Right. People aren't waiting quite as long. There's still a long way to go to improve that. But we've done it uh, two years in, in a row. This is the third annual. June it's on 16th. June, June 16th at the Como Zoo, not the- St. Paul. Yeah, right in the heart of St. Paul. What and time? It's uh, 9 o'clock. Um, registration opens, I believe, at 8 o'clock, June 16th. You can register online if I can just yeah, right pick ahead. this up and read what it is. It's a little, so it's the uh, dystonia-foundation.org forward slash Twin Cities dash zoo dash walk. And we'll find a graphic and hopefully get that up on, sure on camera. On your, up on your website, which yeah, is what? Yeah, BillyMcLaughlin.com. Spell you McLaughlin. McLaughlin is M-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. So McLaughlin. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And so there's there's information there uh, on my Facebook page as well. And uh, we had about 300 people out last year, which was, uh, again, it's a growing event because this community is a, a lot of people who don't want to admit that they've got right. a disability. This is Paul Metzger, you're watching Wall of Power TV.